Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Rick Swatsky. I'm a scientist, a research scientist at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences um, and some other things. But I'm here to introduce um, and welcome um, uh, Dr. Chema Valderas and Ian Porter. They're visiting us uh, from the UK, from the University of Exeter, uh, for establishing a, a collaboration. Um, focusing roughly on the topic that you see on the screen right here. So uh, Chema is a professor of health service and, and policy research. He's also a physician um, at the University of Exeter. He's also president of the International Society of Quality of Life Research. And um, he leads a, um, a, a health services and policy research group at the University of Exeter Med Medical School. And uh, Ian is a postdoctoral research associate, also um, at Health Services and Policy Research Group at the University of Exeter. So very welcome to both of you. And I also just want to say there is a couple, I don't have no idea how many people are online. And I don't think there is a feedback mechanism for those of you who are online. So I'm speaking into hyperspace here, but um, just mm -hmm. wanting to welcome you as well for those of you who have logged in online and the webinar will also be available um, on the Kios website afterwards. So I'm going to hand it over to you. So thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you Rick for the, the introduction um, and uh, uh, thank you for the uh, Kios uh, uh, Center for uh, inviting us to. Uh, we're here for two days of uh, uh, interaction and discussions around uh, uh, for a com for a uh, combined uh, program of research around how to improve outcomes for um, elderly uh, people uh, using uh, patient-centered uh, outcome measurement approaches. Um, we come indeed from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, we have not, I think it's the first time that Ian and myself do this uh, presentation in tandem. So uh, please apologies if something doesn't necessarily go as uh, expected. Um, where, where the hell is Exeter? It's, it's here. Uh, here, this part of the, uh, that, that's Devon in the United Kingdom, in the peninsula. Uh, this is uh, literally what you can see from my office and uh, not necessarily the whole campus is like this only this particular bit but it's worth seeing and uh, um, Exeter is very close to what is called the, the English Riviera which I think the important bit of it I mean the truthful is that is that the English Riviera yeah okay maybe the <laughs> Italian and French do a better the job in terms of the term but we have really uh, a beautiful uh, 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 nature surrounding us and uh, uh, the, both beaches and uh, uh, this is the moors to, to national parks uh, that you can visit so you're very welcome to, to come and see us in, in Exeter if you're interested in, in, in knowing the UK. Uh, we have, uh, we, we are aiming to speak for about 35 minutes or so and then have uh, a lot of time for discussion if that's okay uh, uh this may because we have an, a large number of slides it may, you may see that we perhaps go uh, uh do not spend too much time on some of them but we'll be happy to use them uh if you you have questions on on specific aspects so we will start giving you a a, a background to, to what we're doing and then focus on on three particular uh projects that may be of your interest first is a cochrane systematic review uh, it will turn, well, uh, a review of randomized controlled trials on using patient reported outcome measures uh, and feeding that information back to patients and to health professionals for improving care. Then we will talk about a metasynthesis of uh, 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 studies in which uh, patients and health professionals were asked about uh, their views on, on using this methodology as part of clinical care. And then we will also uh, present to you the, the results of a pilot study that we did uh, uh, focusing on the uh, on, yeah, a, a specific application that we did in Exeter. So, and welcome to all uh, webinar participants. Um, we'll progress with the session. 
So I don't necessarily, so that will, I will go quickly through then through these slides. So what are patient reported conventions are any measurement of a patient health status of, uh, that comes directly from uh, the patient. And uh, basically you typically have a stimulus, an item, how much bodily pain have you had during the past two weeks, for example. Then you have a response scale. Uh, this is, for instance, it can, well, it can be a liquid type scale, a, a graded a response scale, or it can be in terms of words, uh, different response options, or it can be, for instance, this a visual analog scale as well. And then you end up having a, a scoring system which may include different domains, different weights. So for instance, for the, the uh, uh, um, measures for, for the uh, physical pain domain of promise, you would have percentages on a T-score, or you can have a physical health summary uh, in the SF12, uh, for instance. So these are the, the typical elements of a patient report or outcome measure, which are uh, typically they come in the form of questionnaires of different uh, structures. So what are we, what are these questionnaires measuring? They measure uh, things as reported by patients, but typically we're not too much interested in asking patients what their blood pressure, what they believe their blood pressure is, or what they believe their height is. We're more interested, or when it's really rich information is when we ask in relation to symptoms, functional status, general health perceptions, and health-related quality of life. This is a model which aims to integrate a previous model by uh, published in JAMA in 1996, I believe, and then the International Classification of Functioning. Uh, and, uh, and we also try to include here, I mean, symptom status capture issues related to physical and psychological domains, whereas functional status and others capture also the social aspect domain. And one thing that is perhaps sometimes over, overlooked is that the psychological status of the, the individual, which is also a characteristic, if you want, of the, of the individual, both characteristics of the individual and of the environment, in the, you can see them on the top and the, on the bottom, they, they modify how people report on, on, on their on the symptoms or functional status and has really quality of life. The psychological status itself, uh, uh, which would be part of the, the, these boxes here may have an impact on how you report uh, uh, on, let's say, your, your uh, physical status or your social status. Um, so, um, starting with the uh, uh, systematic review of the, the literature. So, basically, what we will be talking about today, a set, is about how uh, using patient reported outcome measures as part of clinical practice um, can enhance or uh, uh, quality of care uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and outcomes of care. Uh, the question is not trivial uh, because at the end of the day patient report outcome measures were not designed uh, for this particular purpose uh, but rather mostly for research purposes. And uh, it's uh, also not a given uh, that uh, something that appears to be a good idea uh, necessarily makes uh, sense and actually improves anything in a meaningful way or even can may, uh, uh, it could potentially have also detrimental effects. So uh, in 2008 we conducted a systematic review of uh, the literature and we identified at that time, 2008, 28 studies and the interventions that were being compared was feedback of PROMS to health professionals only uh, um, as opposed to other, uh, 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 other uh, I mean, not including patients, for instance, uh, plus or minus additional interventions compared to not providing feedback. 50% um, of the studies identified uh, had uh, focus on the area of mental health uh, uh, and used uh, accordingly mental health uh, uh, measures. Uh, other measures used were uh, generic uh, measures of generic health status and also measures of uh, arthritis of respiratory uh, conditions. This is specific measures. Two thirds of the studies roughly showed some impact on processes of care, particularly improved rate of diagnosis, improved rates of education, 
uh, uh, providing advice or providing education or referring or providing counseling. And almost one in two showed some impact on outcomes. Because of few, some problems with heterogeneity, we did not, uh, uh, at that time, feel comfortable doing a meta-analysis, and that's where we uh, uh, left it. Um, the most clear benefit was for screening and diagnosis of uh, depression, as this particular use, and the more recent uh, uh, studies uh, were showing increased impact on outcomes. And that's why we uh, started a couple of years ago an update uh, through the Cochrane uh, collaboration. The uh, uh, objective was similarly similar, but uh, at this uh, uh, time we were also interested in seeing whether the feedback to patients would make any difference. Um, here what we had is to, uh, uh, we focused on uh, the processes of care, so uh, uh, whether uh, uh, it improved patient-physician communication, awareness of patients' quality of life, diagnosis and recognition rates, treatment rates, health services and research use, and patient behavior. And we, uh, uh, although we were interested in those uh, variables, we were particularly interested in, in improvement in health outcomes, both generic and disease-specific uh, measures. We searched uh, a number of databases for uh, this uh, randomized controlled clinical trials or cluster randomized controlled <coughs> clinical uh, trials. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, we wanted that uh, we make it a specific requirement that people were uh, recruited um, because of the interaction with uh, health services uh, so that they were being used in a context uh, in which there would be a clinician uh, tasked or for actioning uh, the feedback. We excluded studies uh, outside uh, uh, healthcare settings. Um, okay, in terms of the interventions, we focus on interventions where patient report outcome measures were administered to patients, and then we considered feedback whether it went either to the patient or the health professional or uh, both. And the control condition was simply a, a routine clinical practice without any feedback of the information. Um, I've already discussed the main primary and secondary outcomes that we were interested in. Um, we conducted the, the, the searches in two stages um, uh, that was completed in 2016. And a, seven, 16, and a second one which was completed by the end of 2018. The first one we identify 76 studies and in the second one in that brief period we identify up to uh, 100, a, a, a total, a combined total of 101 uh, studies. Most of them were had been conducted in the US, a minority of them in the UK and Netherlands and a number of other different countries of your interest four of them had been conducted in Canada. And as you can see, there's an increasing uh, interest in, in, the, in the topic. So from uh, uh, a handful, less than a handful of studies in the 70s to uh, very sig uh, high significant numbers in the, in the recent decade. Um, most of the studies were conducted in primary care, uh, but also in oncology, in psychiatry, and also when they were conducting primary care, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the focus was uh, generic, but sometimes they were specific of, uh, for instance, a diagnosis, supporting diagnosis and screening of mental health uh, problems. But they also, uh, also a significant number of them were conducted in psychology uh, settings. I know nine is not a, a very significant in terms of 101, but they were relatively homogeneous. Uh, in terms of the methodology. So it will be basically therapy, uh, people receiving therapy for psychological problems and a number of other settings. Um, so we're still crunching the data, but we thought you might be interested in, interested in knowing whether we found any significant differences. And yes, we identified in terms of quality of life, generic quality of life, we identified a small effect 
favoring the intervention, favoring the feedback, uh, so that is an effect size, a standardized uh, difference of 0.1, um, uh, which was, uh, as I said, statistically significant. When we combined additional studies measuring disease-specific quality of life, uh, the estimate was not too different, but the uh, confidence in, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, no, no, they were, I got confused with, with another outcome, sorry. And they, it was also uh, still uh, uh, significant uh, for uh, when, you, when we included that this is specific uh, quality of life measurement. In terms of functioning, we studied separately physical, mental and social functioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was interesting is uh, we didn't find any uh, differences for uh, physical functioning or for social functioning. And we uh, found uh, not to different effect on mental uh, functioning, uh, not to different in terms of the standardized difference. Um, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's it, important to note, as I, as I was saying previously, that a, a proportion of these studies focus specifically on trying to improve uh, mental health uh, care. So uh, 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 it is not too surprising that that's, uh, uh, that's the, the specific uh, domain of functioning that was improved. And... Um, because we also wanted to, to know, we we're interested in, for the for the benefit of this collaboration we are uh, developing with uh, the, the University of British Columbia and other Canadian uh, institutions, uh, we wanted to know what was the the, the information there for um, on uh, with for elderly population. We uh, we only have identified for this slide uh, uh, the studies that included some. Uh, information. So as you can see, f specifically focusing on an elderly population, there were only three studies. Um, focusing on uh, um, uh, specific conditions that were almost by definition uh, elderly patient related, there were uh, uh, a larger population. And then there were a number of studies, four, that included a specific subgroup analysis. So although they didn't fit any of the previ two previous categories, they had a specific subgroup analysis for uh, um, elderly patients. And so this is, for instance, one of the, the uh, uh, further analysis of this data is something that we hope we can do together with uh, uh, Rick's uh, team and uh, the, the other partners involved. Um, I will hand it over to Ian to introduce the results of the metasynthesis. So, uh, hello, yeah, I'm uh, Ian Porter, the other part of the double axe. So, anyone webinar when Lander, don't be concerned about a change in accent. So, um, this was so basically, uh, this is complementary to the uh, the system, the uh, Cochrane review uh, Chairman mentioned. So, this was actually looking at uh, qualitative studies, looking at perceptions. Uh, for using PROMS in clinical practice for both uh, clinicians and patients. So uh, the underlying goals were to review and summarise studies on patients and healthcare professionals' perspectives about the use of PROMS, uh, specifically in primary care, to identify barriers and enablers to their use. So uh, we, uh, in terms of methodology, we conducted a uh, qualitative systematic uh, review using an, a number of uh, databases and also ad identified some additional references through snowballing. Um, we had uh, five people screened all the references for eligibility and uh, the studies were con conducted, as I said, in primary care settings um, using either specifically a qu qualitative methodology uh, using quality method, methods exploring patients and or healthcare professionals' perspectives on the clinical utility of using PROMS. Um, it also included uh, mixed method studies where there was a specific qualitative component looking at that aspect. And uh, we c conducted a thematic analysis. Um, in terms of the, uh, so in terms of the overall numbers of our search, uh, we got a uh, over 11,000 uh, hits, which uh, we whittled down to uh, 21 texts included, studies included in the review. 
uh, in terms of some of the studies, those 21. So, um, uh, yeah, so t yeah, tw um, 12 of those were in the, were in the UK, two in Canada, two in the Netherlands, two Sweden, two USA, one Germany, one Norway. And I suppose that's quite interesting in it in itself because uh, as Chamber identified, the vast majority of uh, studies involving feedback of problems are conducted in uh, the USA, but actually the, uh, the limited amount of, re of uh, research actually looking at what uh, you know, uh, clinician and uh, patient perspectives on their use. Um, so uh, eight of the studies were looking purely at professionals, uh, five only patients, and eight were a combination of uh, both. Um, the, so the majority of studies were mental health related, focusing on mood disorders, and uh, the problems most commonly reported were uh, the Edinburgh Post Postnatal Depression Scale, the Beck Depression Inventory, the PHQ-9, and the Hospital Anxiety and Depression <laughs> Scale. Uh, one thing I think is important to point out is that, um, as you'd imagine, some of the earlier studies were... Um, pen and paper in terms of administration but the the shift has been to not just incorporate not just look at uh, clinicians and patients perspectives on the tools themselves but also uh, the electronic implementation and uh, any issues that might raise so uh, I'll just highlight some of the, uh, the, the the key findings we found overall so uh, both patients and professionals highlight a number of benefits using PROMS in terms of supporting decision-making, patient awareness and management <coughs> options. Um, there were, however, a number of notable con contrasts in that both sides worried... On the one hand, both sides worried about PROMS undermining the human contact aspect, yet but there was also an, there was an acknowledgement that <coughs> they can actually open up sensitive topics, so uh, a patient might not be familiar saying face-to-face -to, -face to, to a clinician, um, something that is they, they regard as particularly sensitive but if they if they put it on a if they if they uh but they might be more it more comfortable <coughs> mentioning that on a, on a prom um but there was it was sort of seen as potential to on the one hand open up and, but also restrict uh conversations uh there was quite a lot of um criticism about uh the the tech the, the technological side uh, electronic problems um on the patient side, they, it was felt they were quite often cumbersome uh, tools to use, um, whereas, uh, whereas there was a frustration of professionals that the uh, the digital health tools weren't often weren't aligned to the the electronic systems they were using in practice. Um, and one another another aspect that was identified was uh, what you might call a negative foo feedback loop, in that patients. Uh, felt frustrated uh, when uh, they were when they when they were having problems administered but weren't being given the feedback. Um, but also clinicians often didn't feedback because of their own frustrations and in terms of time, uh, resource, and burden. Um, sometimes to do with uh, a lack of knowledge in terms of um, okay, I've got this tool, but I don't really know how to interpret it or communicate it to patients and worrying about that it might open up conversations that they might not be able to know where to go with that. And there was also uh, often an underlying uh, assumption that the, uh, the so-called clinical judgment is still the gold standard. Um, for the, and uh, one thing we have been looking at as well, specifically what this data is about elderly patients, and I can say that none of the 21 studies, while they were specifically focusing on the elderly population, there were uh, a number of relevant themes uh, highlighted. Um, some of it based on assumptions that uh, proms, electronic proms might be less suitable for older people, but not, as I said, often the assumption, not necessarily uh, citing specific evidence for that. Um, there were, con there were um, uh, concerns that proms on cell phones and mobile devices could become a replacement for personal consultation and end up in being reinforced re exacerbating social isolation um, but also on the, on the positive side there was actually, there was a feeling that um, actually 
encouraging more elderly people to be using proms in elderly practice could actually challenge uh, sometimes negative stereotypes that health professionals have about elder people and their quality of life, enabling them to be treated more as individuals. And uh, now we're going to talk about uh, uh, a pilot study we've conducted in Devon. Uh, so I'll hand over to Chairman Brief, then you'll hand back to me. Thank you. So <clears throat> all this was preparatory work, really. I mean, although the, the systematic review is taking a lot longer than anticipated because of the large number of studies. Um, uh, um, it was preparatory work to, to develop an intervention to be uh, used in prim primary care in the United Kingdom uh, for uh, uh, based on the use of uh, uh, patient report outcome measures for improving care for people with multiple uh, conditions in general practice. In the UK, uh, um, everybody has uh, 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 access to a primary care uh, physician that is a, a general practitioner who is responsible for uh, uh, managing their care and uh, who acts also as a uh, the port of entry to the to the system. Um, we uh, distilled all this previous information into uh, uh, um, into a framework um, where we identified what might be the clinical applications of patient reported outcomes based on the uh, evidence, uh, uh, but but also on our on other uh, more broader uh, conceptual frameworks. So. I won't spend too much time because it's, we have already one and a half an hour, but I wanted that we finish in about 10 minutes or so. But basically, it's, there are plenty of opportunities for using patient report outcomes as part of the clinical process for informing risk stratification. So basically telling someone, okay, you've been diagnosed with this condition based on your uh, scores on patient report outcome. These are the outcomes that we can expect in five or 10 years uh, for supporting decision making for treatment. I mean, <clears throat> if you have this particular score, uh, you are likely to, if you, and if you did choose to go and have an operation to replace your hip, uh, the probability that you will be get better is this. Um, or for facilitated communication, for instance, between health professionals. So when you uh, discuss in a part of the multidisciplinary team with a patient with, let's say, COPD, uh, you may be able to convey what is their functioning and what is the quality of life in a way that is standardized and that allows everybody to have a shared understanding of what is the degree of impact that the condition has on their uh, uh, health. So there, there, there is a, there are, there, there's almost no single interaction between clinicians and health uh, and uh, uh, patients or between uh, uh, clinicians in relation to a specific patient that where patient report outcomes would not have a uh, role. We developed a framework for the implementation of PROs in clinical practice also as part of this previous effort in which we identified that three things were absolutely co key to successful uh, implementation. Was One was the choice of the patient reported outcome measure itself and uh, nothing of this list will necessarily surprise you. Valid, responsive, interpretable, simple, tailored to a particular setting. Um, in terms of the, the, other, the other two issues were, were the feedback system that it needed to be integrated into the standard information system and with the pathway at the right, uh, 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 at the right point in the, in the pathway. And finally, that clinicians really uh, benefited from having specific training on the interpretation of scores and outputs. And interpretation was identified as something that was also particularly relevant. So, um, why did we focus on uh, multimorbidity in particular? Uh, there are many uh, reasons, but perhaps they can be uh, uh, summarized in that um, um, in general practice in the UK has been increasing, although it is by almost by definition a uh, uh, holistic approach to, to healthcare, it's been increasingly driven by condition-specific targets, guidelines, uh, pathways of care, and, uh, um, and speci even by specific financial incentives, uh, which uh, uh, are by and large uh, focused on the performance in relation to hypertension or diabetes or 
uh, hip uh, pain. But there is almost nothing that actually uh, incentivizes, from a financial perspective, their integration. So on paper, someone can be very good at ticking all these boxes, but that the result really uh, uh, meets the needs of, of the patient is, uh, remains to be demonstrated. Um, so we wanted to use patient reported outcomes to uh, help us elicit the, the patient priorities, reconcile competing demands between these conditions and also between the clinical and the patient agenda. Um, uh, to, to use it for improving the engagement of patients in their own care and basically to start the process of moving to a focus on process of care for managing care to a pro focus on, on outcomes. And I think that's one of the, 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 the um, some, perhaps this, uh, um, this slide may help um, better explain wh where we're coming from. So. The focus on, on all, all these studies that I presented as part of the Cochrane Review and that also Ian described in terms of the uh, 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 qualitative research on the use of PROMS in clinical practice starts with the notion of clinical management and with a specific disease focus. So here the focus is typically on measurement. Can we elicit a reliable, valid, responsive estimate of what is the health status of an individual. And um, typically standardized PROs, that's where they, they have a, a, an established and, and, and strong role. And this, is, this follows the, 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 uh, to some, to by, by and large, the biomedical model of care. But if we start from a different perspective, from patient-centered care, we are particularly interested in the whole person approach. So. Uh, it has us clinicians that have a, uh, a, a particular interest in deconstructing the patient in different organs and different conditions. Um, people approach healthcare because they have problems that uh, do not necessarily explain themselves purely in terms of the uh, gamma GT enzyme in the liver, but rather I mean, whether they are tired or whether they can perform the activities they are interested in or what uh, 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 general challenges to their health care, so, so to their health. So they're interested in a whole person approach. So it is particularly important to identify for these people what are the goals for health care. And that's where individualized patient report outcome measures can play a significant role. And we believe this is better tuned with the psychosocial model of health, uh, uh, of health and disease. And actually, what's wrong with actually combining uh, the best of, best of both worlds? So that's why in, in coming up with, uh, in defining the intervention uh, in, uh, that we piloted in Exeter, we used both standardized PROs and individualized patient reported outcome measures. Uh, I'm aware of the time, so I will skip a few of uh, less relevant slides. So basically what we did is we started by identifying people with multiple conditions. What conditions? Asthma, COPD, depression, diabetes, heart failure and osteoarthritis. Why these conditions? Well, um, as you will see, some all of them are chronic, but they have different patterns of evolution. So some of them will go in peaks, some others are progressively deteriorate, deteriorating, others uh, have a particular focus on mental health, others have a very symptomatic, others have a, 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 a comp a mostly asymptomatic and have uh, an important uh, burden of uh, treatment and management. So we wanted to ha be, be able to capture a variety of, of problems. Also, very importantly, most of them are included in the uh, quality and outcomes framework, which is a system for incentivizing the performance of clinicians in relation to specific conditions in general practice in the UK. Um, at present, about 20% of their income uh, was linked to uh, those uh, performance measures. And so what did we measure? We used the patient-generated index to elicit an individualized, uh, uh, um, it's a page individualized patient report outcome measure by which you ask the individual to uh, uh, what are their uh, main, uh, to identify activities that are a priority for them, to rate what is the uh, uh, level of performance on them, 
but you, they even have the opportunity to give different weights to uh, those uh, five core activities. We included the EQ5 team, which uh, I, I, must, I, I must acknowledge it. We just included it to get the funding because we believe it's an awful measure to use in clinical practice. Uh, uh, but, but, I mean, I've already explained that I, I'm, I'm, we're not necessarily a huge fan. It is true that because it is consistently used in uh, evaluations of uh, the uh, uh, cost effectiveness of interventions. And so we are, have a very strong uh, health technology assessment institution, NICE, the International Institute for Clinical uh, and Healthcare Excellence, which makes decision about funding for specific uh, interventions and uh, treatment based on EQ5T evaluations it really does make sense to use it. We still believe that uh, as a measure of overall health uh, has significant limitations, but we still include it. And then we used as many condition-specific measures as needed for each uh, um, uh, condition. And uh, we also fed back the information to the patient. We gave them scores and explained what their scores meant and we gave it to nurses uh, who originally we considered pract pract general practitioners. In the end, they were most of them nurse practitioners for a number of reasons. In the UK, most of the care for chronic conditions is now being delivered by uh, nurses, which typically call patients on an annual basis and use standardized templates for delivering care. Uh, and you will see that the next arrow is not red, basically meaning we hoped <coughs> there was a care plan and we hoped that that would uh, establish a circle, but we did not measure whether there was indeed a care plan and we actually, the, 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 that's the model, but in the, in the pilot that Ian will, will result, the results of which Ian will uh, present, we did, not, we did not repeat it, we did not this iteratively. Um, these are the measures, um, but well, okay, yeah, measures. So I think you will recognize most of them. You're relatively familiar with the uh, patient report outcome measures literature, AQLQ the, for asthma or the uh, clinical COPD questionnaire or the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. They are all very uh, well-established instruments and somebody else did the work for us of identifying those measures as part of another funded project. Uh, what, so that's how we fed back the information to the clinicians or to the patients. So for each of the health conditions, we presented them on a sliding scale from worst to best, and uh, uh, they were informed of basically what they had uh, set. And we did exactly the same for uh, the overall health measured using the EQ5T and for the health priorities that they had uh, uh, identified. So it was, if you want, it was sort of a mirror approach. So it was not further digested. We did, we did digest it a lot more for uh, uh, clinicians. So for instance, for the COPD, uh, you have here two school questionnaires that we used, the clinical COPD questionnaire, CCQ, and the MRC breathlessness score. And, uh, um, you have how sh so basically what we did is we provided information as to what the scores ranges and extremes uh, how they are supposed to be interpreted we also gave them information about what are the average and range of scores in general practice where that information was available which is not too frequently and then we also looked in nice and other uh, clinical practice guide guidance for uh, any information that was relevant to patient reported outcomes in those uh, uh, in relation to that condition so that they could put that uh, uh, score in the context of the clinical practice uh, guidelines they were expected to uh, follow and adhere to and Ian we will tell you more about what happened yeah so uh, in so in this uh, study we recruited uh, five uh, practices in uh, Devon which uh, if you think back to, to the beginning so Shema said this is you know this is a county in the southwest of England and uh, uh, the the five practices they encompassed uh, urban and rural areas 
So um, uh, it was we we designed it so to reduce burdened healthcare systems that it would uh, align itself neatly with the existing annual review. So basically, we were proposing, uh, if you like, a, a PROMS review incorporated into the standard uh, annual review for patients. Um, this and there's a pilot, a non-controlled, uh, uh, randomised design. Um, and uh, so we recruited up to 20 patients per pract of per pr of the five practices with any combination of asthma, COPD, diabetes, depression, heart failure, uh, osteoarthritis of the hip or knee. And uh, yeah, we in we identified patients from electronic records. Um, so what we do in terms of what I'm going to talk briefly about now is uh, how we looked at the uh, how we have evaluated the, the feasibility and acceptability of this intervention in terms of uh, recruitment acceptability in terms of recruitment acceptability to patients and clinicians which we did in terms of uh, um, after each review we gave a standardized brief survey for both patients and clinicians to fill in but uh, after the at the end of the project uh, we also conducted qualitative interviews with, with uh, patients and participating practitioners and we also did uh, an evaluation of costs. Um, so Chema mentioned that we used uh, an individualised PROM, uh, the Patient Generated Index. So on this, uh, patients could mention, without being given a predefined box tick, they could identify any priority. And uh, as you can see here, the, the, one, the, biggest, the biggest and the boldest are the ones which came up the most. So aspects like uh, walking and mobility came, fatigue came up the most, but there was a wide, a wide range of things, in, also including things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, grandchildren and social aspects as well. Um, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the, in terms of the PROMS review, um, this, is, this is a feedback I have from, from the patient uh, survey. So um, over 90% thought that the summary was easy to understand. Um, and uh, as Chem said, we gave, we gave patients, uh, if you like, a more uh, simplified graphical representation. Um, and, but only 7% said they would have liked more detailed information when they were asked about that. And uh, over 95% over said they actually dis dis discussed the pro summary in the review. Over 80% found it useful. 90% um, found it a useful way of prioritising their health issues, particularly with the individualised PROM. And 76% uh, would like to see patient reported outcomes as part of their routine care. Um, similarly, in terms of the, the clinicians, 95% uh, um, thought the information was easy to understand and 89% found it was useful for conducting their reviews. Um, I'm going to so in terms of the uh, what came out of the qualitative in interviews. So in terms of experience of completing the questionnaires, uh, patients found it uh, all combinations the standardised and generic individualised, uh, positive, straightforward, and also appreciated that sometimes just by completing the questionnaires encouraging an awareness of health. Uh, patients would often say that actually just by completing a measure got them to reflect on that part of their health and then they would go home and discuss it with their partner. Uh, in terms of the summary, um, patients seemed to think actually simplicity was key. They didn't want to be bombarded with lots of information. They kind of, they wanted to highlight, overall they wanted to highlight, you know, points which highlighted well they were doing, which they felt would aid their prioritisation. However, there were, some patients did actually say they, they would have liked more detail. So I think the idea is you don't approach it in a, uh, a one size fits all way be, be you know be aware that different patients required would like different amounts of uh, information um, overall uh, in terms of being part of the routine care uh, people taking part thought it, it would be good if it was used as routinely although there was skepticism about whether their GPS would actually use it if, if it but to do with their burden and other pressures um, and uh, yeah, I think that those are the main points I'll mention here. In terms of the clinician interviews, uh, they highlighted it was actually a positive experience for pa both patients and participating clinicians. Um, some of the clinicians basically said it was the, the, the best review they had ever basically, you know, they'd conducted. Um, they thought it was useful in terms of highlighting how well patients are managed. Um, 
again positive about the uh, the, the, the uh, prom summary. Uh, overall, again, the message was that simplicity is key, although it's good to have supporting information to draw on uh, if necessary. And uh, again, there are positive thoughts about using it as a routine part of care, particularly in terms of monitoring over time. Um, we actually, in terms of, we, we looked at the cost intervention, so uh, for year one it would have worked out. So I, I can't quite work out the, uh, the conversion rate from between Canada and the UK, but basically for year one we worked out as uh, um, 11, basically £11.58 per patient, and year two reducing to £5.83. Um, so uh, less than ten US dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Chair Ch does a bit better than I do there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, in so basic, so we we demonstrated with this. So this is the first evaluation of the routine uh, prom assessment for patients with multi morbidity in primary care in the UK, and we demonstrated feasibility in terms of re recruitment, acceptability, uh, cost effectiveness, and also a dual effect and that was an impact. On both professionals and patients. So, uh, just to wrap up the uh, the presentation. So, uh, today we've looked at the the role for uh, PROs in clinical practice. Uh, covered some of the uh, the emerging evidence for impact on process and also outcomes of care. Uh, in terms of qualitative research, um, the the patient and clinician perspective is that PROMs have value, but there are uh, overriding concerns of implementation and uh, access and uh, we've also shown evidence for feasibility for using in the elderly population in the UK using individualised and standardised measures so uh, thank you everyone for listening and we'll be very happy to take any questions you may have I think I understand we have another 12 minutes yeah, or so exactly. Sorry, that took a bit longer than anticipated. Uh, yeah. Slide of clinical applications. Yes, I Thank think you. you probably mean this one. Yeah, in front of. You're welcome. Any particular question in relation to the slides, or just for no, the pleasure? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for the presentation. So I'm a, I'm a supporter of using patient reporting and outcome measures, so I think this is important work. So one of the things that we're doing in a, in a, a Canadian context is thinking about where the research questions come from. Mm -hmm. So like, like sort of trying to engage patients, people with lived experience, to help us understand what research questions we should be asking. So I'm sort of intrigued by, I, I'm a bit nervous about like seeing PROMs as the solution for everything. Um, uh, even though I'm a supporter of using PROMs, um, I think we need to be careful about where are we going to get maximum impact and where does this really make sense from a perspective of someone with multi-morbidity as well as someone who's providing care. So I was intrigued to sort of understand like, why did you land on this question and do you see PROMs as the solution to everything? Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the comment. The, I, I'll take start with the, the, the second question. No, I don't think it is the, the solution to, to, to everything. I think it's one of the... Uh, um, um, it's an, a relevant approach to try to change the way things are uh, uh, being organized currently in healthcare. So uh, thinking in terms of the UK, the general, in general practice, the context where uh, financial incentives are being oriented towards ensuring that your blood pressure is above 140. If we want to move to outcome measurement, it's very difficult to uh, uh, incentivize anything if you don't have a measurement of it. Uh, will it be, is it a good idea to start measuring problems of everybody not considering number of things that we were discussing today, a response shift, uh, 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 differential item functioning, uh, what are the best tools, uh, whether they, it makes sense to use them uh, uh, for clinical purposes and the same one uh, for uh, uh, at the, at the organizational level of a, of a provider or a, a national level. There are many, 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 many issues that are relevant to this. So this was a first attempt to see, is it feasible 
to do something like this because m one of the main areas of resistance is first of all we're too busy far too busy to be doing something like this and secondly uh, we wouldn't know what to do and the feasibility demonstrated that the clinicians nurses in particular uh, were very very happy to be able to have that information at hand mm -hmm. so is it a, a solution to everything not at all I think it's a step in that uh, direction um, because of the uh, needs of uh, um, uh, uh, research as it developed in this particular uh, in, in this particular area uh, um, there was an opportunity for doing this without necessarily waiting for uh, developing a more comprehensive uh, approach because it would also have required uh, it would have been a lot more difficult the, to test the feasibility of which we because more likely would have included a number of additional components for ensuring that care was patient-centered but it was conceived more as a wedge Um, they they were in the sense I mean the, the information that you uh, presented so they um, let me see if there is I can give you specific quotes in relation to this I mean uh, one thing I can say is we, ah, we, we, we weren't we weren't uh, we weren't too prescriptive in terms of because uh, ra rather than having uh, one, one of the things we're interested in is actually looking at how clinicians was I mean a number of uh, the studies in the systematic you know, uh, review we mentioned, the randomised studies, a number of them don't actually have any uh, specific guidance, so they leave it up to clinicians. And, and uh, we, took a, we took a similar approach because of, uh, we, we were quite interested in, because we didn't want to say, you know, you start with the conditions, you know, the, from, and then you go to, or, so we're interested in actually kind of how they found, and, the way we found the uh, the practice were using it is that they use the individualized prom as a way in in terms of what's your priority today and often that was very different to actually how they how the clinician cells perceived it in terms of the review so I would say that was probably that seemed to be suggested in terms of, of, of um, you know a, a good way in actually starting with literally here's what the patient has said their priorities are mm. You can do uh, so. The opinion uh, health priorities used as a starting point, aiding monitoring over time. Although we did not repeat the measurement process and the feedback, so that's only uh, 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 so that they see the potential, but we they, it was not uh, necessarily confirmed. And generally, promoting a patient centered approach, which I understand that they were not uh, more specific about. I don't think we have no. specific information about that. I think um, in I think the the, the <coughs> I mean uh, the qualitative interviews raise some in I think I hope this is answering your question. So the qualitative um, interviews raise some in, in terms of how the the consultation went differently to how the practitioners thought it would have so for example uh, there were, there was one there was one case where um, a nurse for reviews basically that, that had an issue with a, a patient and the, the weight and one of the things with these nurses well quite often they, they knew the patients very well over time and uh, they're kind of almost given up trying to go with the, you know the standardized template of here are the um, here are the things you can be doing to lose your weight because the patient was becoming very disengaged by that. but actually what happened with, with the combination of the the the, the, the things the patient self identified on the individual, it was mentioning things that their priorities were, things like, you know, mobility and related areas. And the penny sort of dropped for them that she was actually to, to actually increase my quality of life in these areas. I actually need to be losing my weight. So that was regarded by the practitioner as, you know, a more positive outcome compared to the usual review. Does that sort of answer your well, question? Yeah,
hospital care or the, the course of care changes as a result of your response. Mm. They're very informative, but how, you know, if somebody comes in mm. um, with multimorbidities especially, and, and that person's um, output and their goals might change through the AJ, and, and would, a patient, would a physician, for instance, have a strategy of, of dealing with arthritis that goes this direction and based on um, outcome, they end up changing their course of care for that patient and then you've got a positive change in their life. In that. Are, are there any studies? Or yeah. What is the two parts to that question? So first of all, I, uh, th there is clearly a, a learning curve of introducing a new uh, uh, technology into healthcare. So uh, people will probably ta take more uh, on a bystander approach at the beginning, just letting that information be there and then gradually be more comfortable with making decisions based on that. So I don't think nurses, this was a feasibility study, so uh, I don't think we were never necessarily, uh, 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 it was well suited to measuring whether there had been proper change. They did acknowledge that they were surprised that they used the, the tools to change the approach yeah. during the consultation itself. In the review that we did in 2008, um, there were changes in the process of care. So there was an increase in uh, diagnosis, in the number of referrals that were, were made, uh, advice and education and counseling. So they, it, they, it did change things. In the systematic review that we do, that we are completing now, there are changes in processes as well. I don't have the data, but I think it's in particular relation to referrals. More referrals are being made. So yes, there is the, the, the main problem is that we've, it's, it's a bit of a vicious circle in the sense that you don't have guidelines. I mean, uh, that's, uh, st we would present to the team, we're discussing this, this these days, the, the research we did with, uh, based on uh, exploring the uh, guidance by NICE and uh, others uh, in relation to patient report outcome measures. So, because there is very little in those guidelines as to what you should be doing with 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 proms then there is a, a gap i mean uh, the the scores cannot be readily used to implement a specific activity so um, one area where um, in relation to the use of uh, um, so in the uk one of the incentives that was introduced was to measure <coughs> the severity of depression in people with a recent diagnosis of depression. And, uh, um, and it was uh, uh, very successful. Sorry, I lost my train of thought because I, I was thinking I need to respond this. Um, and the time, sorry. Um, I was, uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> and the reason why it was selected was because, uh, so this incentivization of using measuring the severity was because NICE guidelines had been uh, released that said for tailored to the severity of the condition your treatment so if it's uh, uh, mild try this if it's moderate try this other thing so in that case people would have an opportunity of based on those scores to do something but in most occasions you have a it is very nice to have a score of 86 but then it's not clear what you should be doing with those scores, and that limits the ability of the of the uh, uh, of the feedback to have an immediate impact. I uh, do we have a minute to yeah, answer this question? We do. Um, I should just say the the webinar is closed, <laughs> so ah, um, so, so not, But if you could still answer sorry. the question because it's still being recorded, and okay. I think it's a good question. I'm and very sorry. Then. Online. Um, actually, a number of questions here yeah. I'll read all so of them and then try, try to, to, to respond as much as I can were prompts collected in relation to process of care and patient experience the answer is no other than uh, they were collect <coughs> were people being patients that were just before they were to see their GP and the information was fed back to the GP sorry uh, to the nurse and uh, to them so, but not in relation to, to patient experience. Was data disaggregated by clinician? Yes, everybody. So it, we didn't report at the, at the aggregate level, but rather every clinician received uh, uh, information on their own patient. I think that maybe the question is whether the data was aggregated at clinician level, but that, that was neither, the, 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 wasn't the case either. 
If data was specific to a clinician, how were liability issues addressed regarding any issues reported in the data but not monitored in real time? It was real time because patient would see the clinician immediately thereafter. But that's certainly a problem if there is some, uh, if it's a, a remote uh, measurement. Did clinicians provide, and that's the last one, provide any feedback on differential value from individualized versus standardized patient reported outcome measures? Um, I don't think they did, although Ian, you may want to, but was there any specific, anything that they specifically said about the differences between patient reported and standardized, uh, so individualized and standardized measures? Mm -hmm. I think that they, they responded on them as a whole, no? as a package. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think uh, they, I think they were, I think they were, sort of, they were valued in different ways, and I think in terms of, I think, I think they regarded the individualized tools as being probably more mm. patient centered. Well, I'm not sure that's the right word, but definitely focusing more on uh, prioritization for what was important to that particular patient. I think we have to bring it to a close, but um, thank you very much.